Hello, my name is Tammy Rose and welcome to Concord Days. In the year 1837, a few friends of the slave, two or three in number, held a meeting to see if a society could not be formed in Concord for his benefit. That's from a great book called To Set This World Right by Sandra um, Herbert uh, Petrolinus. Um, my uh, welcome to our show. I'm here with Richard Smith and we're gonna be discussing the abolitionists. Hey, Richard. Hey, Tammy, how are you? Nice to see you again. I'm good. I'm I good. say that every week. It's nice to see you again. I see you every week. <laughs> well, exactly. But because we're still in the midst of the uh, uh, coronavirus, we're this is pretty much the only way that we can really see each other. So right. this is this has pretty know. much become my social life. So anyway, but so so yes, 1837, the beginning of the female anti-slavery society of Concord, um, which is interesting because that quote you read says two or three in number, or th there were more than two or three people uh, who started the female anti-slavery society. Um, and, and there were other female anti-slavery societies as well. And also one, ones created by, by men and, you know. Right, right. Yeah. But so very early on, so w William Lloyd Garrison started the publication of The Liberator in 1831. Um, and that's really kind of the beginning of abolitionism becoming a big thing, uh, not only in Boston, but, but it started to really spread throughout the North. Um, and Garrison realized very early on that it was going to take um, the women uh, of, of Boston and the women of the North to really propel the anti-slavery societies forward. Um, and so it was not abnormal at all for a town of like Concord to have the women specifically form a female anti-slavery society. Garrison himself said the women were the backbone of the anti-slavery society. Um, and, and why do you think that is? Is it because men, it was more difficult for men to take a position publicly because of business? A little bit, I mean, you know, uh, even in Boston in the 1830s, abolitionists got a lot of got a lot of grief from people for being troublemakers and loud mouths and and why are you causing this issue and 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 things like that. But it's it was it was a cultural thing. So in the 19th century, men are the businessmen. Men are the the society and cultural leaders, the town leaders you know, the select men, things like that. Women were the hearth and home and emotional support of the men and family. And so for a lot of people, male and female, it was a natural, uh, natural thing for women to be involved in anti-slavery because they're coming from the heart. You know, it was almost like a, a a Christian, it's a Christian thing to do, and, and it's it's the right thing to do, and that's what that's what women are good at. Women are good at being caring and tender and and, and loving for their fellow human being. So so it kind of started out culturally, but then the big shift was a lot of these men realized, oh my God, these women, <laughs> these women have guts, <laughs> and 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 they were way more forceful and way more angry and way more radical than I think the men expected them to be. Right, and a lot of women were actually able to gain power through that. And, uh, and I, I think there, there's a whole, as, you, as you've mentioned before, there's a whole other tangent about um, women's suffrage and actually getting the right to vote that came through a lot of the power that they were able to um, realize as they're establishing these abolitionist societies. Um, exactly. And that's a whole other episode. We'll do that in the future. Right. Suffer suffragists will be later. Um, exactly. But, exactly. but yeah, so in Concord, we had people like Mary Merrick Brooks. We had Anne Bigelow. Uh, they were married to fairly powerful men, you know, people like judges and lawyers. Um, and the judges and lawyers were a little reticent about being involved in, in something like anti-slavery, but that doesn't mean the wives of the judges and lawyers have to be quiet. 
Um, and and so Mary Merrick Brooks in particular, and and if if anybody studies Concord history for for any amount of time, they always see the name Mary Merrick Brooks, um, and she was one of the most powerful um, and radical and and forceful abolitionists in Massachusetts. And she had a really good working relationship with the Boston abolitionists like William Lloyd Garrison. And she was really the one that kind of put the female anti-slavery society on the map in terms of this is what we're gonna do. These are the, these are the things we're gonna say. And people really kind of followed her when it, when it came to uh, how to get the anti-slavery message out. And, you know, and of course, Concord also had the famous names. So Lydian Emerson and, and Abba Alcott and, and, and Cynthia Dunbar Thorough and her sisters, Helen, or her daughters, Helen and Sophia. So, you know, these are some of the big names. Um, and as early as 1837, the big name men aren't really speaking out against slavery. So, so the women with the big names <laughs> were the ones who were kind of getting the men folk to to hopefully start speaking out against slavery. Lydian Emerson, Ralph Waldo Emerson's wife, yeah. she was the abolitionist in the Emerson family, um, and she's the one who was involved with the founding of the of the society in 1837, and she was the one who was kind of poking and prodding Waldo to maybe to maybe say some things about slavery. Um, and, you know, every 4th of July, she would decorate the front fence of their home in black crepe as a sign of mourning uh, for the slave, which I yeah. just think is such a great story. Um, exactly. And, 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 and why, was, why was Emerson reticent to actually speak out? You know, like getting into transcendentalism and the whole idea of self-reliance, you know, obviously... If, if you're enslaved, that's the exact opposite of what, um, you know, being able to actualize your whole life, you right. know. Well, I think one of the main reasons was because Emerson was famous by, by the early 1840s. He was very well known. He had published uh, a couple of books and, and, and some essays. He was known as a lecturer. By the early 1840s, he was kind of becoming the sage of Concord. And, and he really thought that as a public persona uh, or as a public figure, it really wasn't his place to speak out on issues. Um, mm -hmm. He thought, you know, he, he, you know, even like today, if, if a celebrity speaks out on an issue, I would say that for every person that loves the celebrity speaking out on a public issue uh, like BLM or something like that, there's just as many people who think that because he or she is a rich, a famous person, he or she should shut up. You know, yeah. it's none of your business. And I think Emerson kind of felt the same way. He felt like, well, I'm, I'm known, I'm, I'm famous, quote unquote, who cares what I have to say? And so he was just kind of staying out of it, not because he was afraid of any backlash, but he just found public celebrities speaking out on issues to be a little annoying. <laughs> Even if, you're right, right. Even if it's something as crucial and, you know, as, as you know, deeply philosophic, you know, it gets to the heart of humans and humanity. And, you know, how can one, how can one person own their own soul, let alone like the soul of another person? Right, and, and, and Emerson didn't stay on the sidelines for very long. So in 1844, um, it was the anniversary um, of the uh, West Indies, uh, of the slaves in the West Indies being emancipated. And so Emerson did give um, a lecture uh, uh, on the uh, the tenth anniversary of the liberation of of these slaves in the West Indies, and so that was kind of him finally uh, coming out, <laughs> so to speak, um, and and letting people know that yes, he was anti-slavery, and Emerson was absolutely an abolitionist, absolutely, um, and so once he did that in 1844, then he started to speak out a lot more about it. And then with the fugitive slave law in 1850, he absolutely became incensed and uh, was, was a, a very vocal advocate for the abolition of slavery. 
Yeah. Yeah. And then also I want to get into um, voices of actual people who had been enslaved. So in, um, uh, in, tr in our Facebook group for Transcendentalist 2021, um, the book for March is the narratives of the narrative of Sojourner Truth. And then for April, we're due, I don't know if you can see this, uh, we're doing Fred Frederick Douglass. Um, and he has actually written um, three different uh, autobiographies. And it's interesting to sort of go through each of those pieces to sort of see, um, you know, his like, of course, if you do a biography and then you end up living longer, you have more of a perspective. Um, right. So, could, <laughs> you know, could you tell us a little bit more about Frederick Douglass and his connection to Concord? Well, I, I want to start off by saying so, so those slave narratives that were being published in the 1830s and 1840s and 1850s. And those are just two of, there might've been Many. dozens, of, if not yeah. hundreds of them. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't know if enough credence has been given to the idea that these slave narratives did a lot to really make people aware that enslaved people were human beings. Um, and they knew how to read and they knew how to write and they knew how to talk. You know, when Douglas, when Frederick Douglass published his, his autobiography, I think it was 1845, initially a lot of people north and south said, well, he didn't really write that. How, you know, how, how could he write this? You know, he's, he's an, was an enslaved man. Where did he learn to read and write? You know, and a lot and, of people. And why wasn't maybe, he arrested? And the person who taught him, why weren't they arrested? And right, uh, right. a lot of people thought maybe William Lloyd Garrison had written it for him. Uh, so things like that. So mm -hmm. suddenly people are reading these narratives. And if you've ever read either of those books, there are some fairly horrific things in there um, that nobody in their right mind would think ever happened <laughs> because, because they're just so horrifically terrible. So, so yeah. Douglas really became the preeminent ex-slave <laughs> in the United States um, right. and, and very quickly became one of the leading uh, abolitionist lecturers in the country. And he traveled all over the North and he gave lectures and, and basically he just got up and he talked about his life as a slave. Um, and, and he really kind of for people in Concord or, or people in any small town in New England, it really gave a face to slavery. Because let, let's face it, in, in Concord, in the 1840s and 50s, we had maybe two dozen people of color. Um, so, so it's not like the people of Concord were really seeing a lot of, a lot of, a lot of Black people. Um, so now, and, suddenly, and, and wait, wait, and also, when was uh, slavery, um, you know, abolished or uh, made illegal in Massachusetts? Can you oh, help us? Way with back that? in, in 1790, 1795, 91? when when we became a yeah. state. Yeah, yeah, so the late 18th century. So, I mean, not to say that. I mean, if you go to Boston, you would have seen a lot of people of color, both free and formerly enslaved. So, but in a, a small town like Concord, we had like 2,000 people. So uh, seeing somebody like Frederick Douglass come to your town, whether it's Concord or, or Akron, Ohio, or, or even Boston, where you see people of color, you know, here's a man who was, from all accounts, very forceful in his, in his speech, very articulate, very angry. You know, you always hear words that he was smoldering, and 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 that you could tell that he was just itching to get these words out. To see yeah. somebody like that, really, I think, put a face to slavery for a lot of white Northerners. Um, and he was well acquainted with a lot of people in Concord. Uh, he was here a couple of times lecturing. Um, he became acquainted with people like Mary Merrick Brooks. Uh, he became friends with Helen Thoreau, um, Henry David Thoreau's older sister, and they actually had a correspondence with each other for a while and wrote letters to each other. Um, mm -hmm. So he, he was, for a lot of people, he was the living symbol of, of not only what life as a slave was like, but what a person who was formerly enslaved could make of himself because in an era in the 1840s when it's all about the self-made men you know everybody who's a president or a politician Abraham Lincoln he's a self-made man mm 
you know, Frederick Douglass is the, the self-made man because he's an ex-slave. Yeah. And, and so he's really kind of making slavery uh, real to a lot of people and showing people what a, a person of color can do once he's free from his bondage. Yeah. Um, and also, I, I wanted to bring up, since you had mentioned that he had to defend himself, even Harriet Beecher Stowe, um, she wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin, and then she literally had to publish a key to Uncle Tom's Cabin, where she actually showed her research um, of all of the horrific things that she portrayed in a, you know, a novel form format. Um, but it was all, it was based on, you know, true facts and sure. based on documented things. Sure. Um, and and when, also when it was published in 1852, immediately all across the South, people said, well, she's lying. She's lying. She made, she made all that stuff up. You know, oh, it's just a novel. You can't take a novel seriously, you know. Yeah. And, and so, you know, Mrs. Stowe, God bless her. She said, nope, <laughs> here are my notes. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> but, you know, as a historian, you know, that, that does my heart good. <laughs> if somebody says, well, that's not true. And I'm like, nope, here's my research. You know? Exactly, here are the receipts, you know. <laughs> right, and that's exactly what she did. In fact, yeah. I read, I read that that book more than I've ever actually read Uncle Tom's Cabin, because I find I find that book show show it again. Yeah, show exactly. Again. Ooh, sorry. <laughs> so, so yeah. yeah, so exactly. I the find, key. I find that to be way more interesting than than the actual Uncle Tom's Cabin. Yeah, well, and also, so the the novel Uncle Tom's Cabin, we can also talk about how it was adapted into, you know, a, a play, a stage play, and all of the characters were turned into stereotypes. So now actually when the book is discussed, it's more actually discussed in terms of the, you know, Uncle Tom and someone being an Uncle Tom and the, the impact of the novel itself um, doesn't get like, you know, it's, it's been diffused and turned into something else in our modern day. But do you do you know about the history of Uncle Tom's Cabin and how it sort of came to be in, in popular culture? Absolutely. I think that? I think that we kind of forget there are various there are some books in our history that were kind of like cultural touchstones. Um, and Uncle Tom's Cabin was, in my mind, the pre-Civil War, the antebellum cultural touchstone, uh, published in 1852. It affected everybody, North and South. You know, if you were a Northerner and you were an abolitionist, you read it. If you were a Southerner and you were a slaveholder, you read it. <laughs> you know, everybody was reading it. Um, as for our people in Concord, you know, we don't know if Henry Thoreau read Uncle Tom's Cabin, I wouldn't be surprised if he did, you know, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure he did. He doesn't talk about it. Right. But it's just one of those books that affected everybody. You know, I'm, I'm trying to think of something in our time that, that would have that kind of a cultural effect, some kind of a movie, maybe something like Jaws or, or The Exorcist. <laughs> <clears throat> or something right. like that when they came out, when Jaws came out, suddenly everybody was afraid to swim, you know, um, and, 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 and everybody yeah. suddenly shark sightings are going up a thousand percent. Uh, right. Uncle Tom's Cabin, everybody had an opinion, everybody read it, and rather than just use it as a book, suddenly lots of anti-slavery societies around the country are putting on dramatic plays, dramatic representations of Uncle Tom's Cabin. Um, and that became almost like a, a little cottage industry in itself, was every town, every anti-slavery society, um, every organization that was trying to raise money for something, uh, they would do a production of Uncle Tom's Cabin. And so it- And, and, and so not all of the scripts were even authorized by her. It oh, was gosh. so popular that people- No, not at all. Yeah. Uh, you know, and so I'm sure that Mrs. Stowe lost a lot of money <laughs> on, on these sort of productions, but you're right. exactly well, right. And, and, yeah. 
and and also her story was misrepresented and turned into you know a blackface you know all sorts of you know vaudeville and all all of that you know american touring theater everybody was sort of coming up with the whole idea and not only was she necessarily losing money but like her the integrity of the piece was you know definitely right. not yeah well not and featured. so and, and and so that's the question when when does something so uncle tom's cabin obviously is a book that was a cultural uh, icon but when does yeah. when does the cultural icon become a pop culture icon and isn't nearly as powerful right you know, or maybe, maybe like black panther absolutely right? Sure. Yeah. Black Panther. Yeah. That's a that's a perfect representation. Black Panther. A lot of people thought, oh, it's just another superhero movie, but the empowerment that that movie gave to people of color in so many ways is absolutely incredible. So so that's almost like the opposite. It's a pop culture thing. It's a superhero movie, but then suddenly it's become more than a superhero movie because it's empowering people of color. Um, to 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 stand up for their beliefs and and go out and try to change the world and be heroic and, and things like that. So mm. that's you know that's kind of cool comparing Uncle Tom's Cabin to the Black Panther. I like that. <laughs> right? There's got to be a PhD thesis out there, you know, coming. You know, if, if or or if you want to write it, you know, you're welcome to do that too. They have to. So, but but yeah. yeah. So. You know, I'm, I can almost bet you that every woman in the Concord Female Anti-Slavery Society read Uncle Tom's Cabin. And I mean, Harriet Beecher Stowe and her husband, they're known to all these people anyway. They're friends. They, they know the Emersons. They, yeah. they know the abolitionists in Boston. Um, so they were very well acquainted with her, with, with the Stowe's um, and and later when the civil war began of course um uh he was involved with uh with efforts to um arm blacks and uh, you know black troops and stuff like that so right. so everybody up here in our neck of the woods they knew who these people were anyway yeah and and also isn't there a story about a little figurine in the concord museum that was given to henry david thoreau there um, is that, so there's a little figurine it's it's of is it of Uncle Tom and Eliza, if, if I'm not mistaken? It's a little porcelain statuette. And the story is that one of the formerly enslaved uh, men that Thoreau helped get to Canada sent that to him uh, from Canada as a thank you. So, so, and that's in the Concord Museum. So yeah, so uh, again, for me, that's, proof that Thoreau, if he didn't read Uncle Tom's Cabin, he at least knew who the characters were. I mean, we all know Uncle Tom. We all know, we all know Eliza. We know all these characters. So, yeah. right. Her name's Eliza, right? Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I haven't yeah. read it in a while. So, um, so yeah. So Uncle Tom's Cabin was huge uh, in terms of not only raising awareness for the anti-slavery movement, but also raising the defense of people who were for slavery because yeah. Yeah. suddenly a lot of slaveholders wanted to prove that uncle tom's cabin was not true and that it was all made up so so it it really kind of was a cultural dividing line in in so in in, in so many ways right and and when she actually when harriet beecher stowe met lincoln the first thing he said to her was, so this is the little lady who started the big war. Right, right. right. So, and so people, so people, you know, I'm sure Lincoln read it. He must have, you know. Um, yeah. It, it's one of those books, I think, that that I can safely say just about everybody read, you know. And yeah. I, th I, I think it should still be read today. Um, you know, at the very least, people should read it to see what all the fuss is about. Right. Right. Yeah. Cool. So, 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 so um, and also just to skip ahead and try to continue with the modern piece of it, um, I just wanted to bring up this book, um, How to Be an uh, Anti-Racist. So this gentleman, um, Ibram X. Kendi, is going to be speaking at the Thoreau Society Annual Gathering, which is going to be um, virtual this year. 
and he was actually asked to participate. So he would have read it last summer. And um, as we're taping this, the, the George Floyd trial is happening. So um, I, wa- I wanted to have us just talk for a minute or so um, just about how the influence of the transcendentalists is still being felt in Concord um, and how, you know, the choice of top, and I believe that the topic for the, um, the annual gathering is, um, is it diversity? Is it? Um, yes, I think it is, right. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's, it's, it's not just, you know, dead white men. It's not just, you know, let's, let's figure out, you know, how, you know, all these, all these old books in, in, and history that just feels dusty and stuff that's already happened. It's how the diversity of stories, the diversity of people um, uh, giving, you know, and, and allowing dignity to all of those stories. And I love how, you know, Thoreau is kind of used as this amazing vehicle because not only you know his life but his stories his journal or his his writings his journal um his journal pieces are all about all of the different people that he met and so i don't know if you have any insight into how um uh ibram was uh, uh, professor kendi was chosen um and if you have any if you want to share any or if you can share any of the the backstage uh insights into that Well, you know, I think, so the Thoreau Society's uh, mission statement is to to spread the the words and and writings and and life of Henry David Thoreau, um, which sounds pretty narrow when you think about it. But then when you realize that Henry Thoreau influenced lots of people who weren't necessarily Thoreauvians, um, in terms of, of political action or in terms of nature conservancy, uh, things like that. And so, you know, when we think, when we think of transcendentalists, you're right, we tend to think of, of dead white guys. Um, but there were, there were transcendentalists who were black. There were transcendentalists who were female. There were transcendentalists uh, who probably didn't even know they were transcendentalists, (laughs) but, but because it's it's a very wide definition and it feels like it doesn't, it's not like the, like the very definition of transcendentalism is, you know, not defined as somebody who follows a very strict philosophy and, you know, it's not like you have to sign up. Yeah. I don't know if Sojourner Truth ever thought of herself as a transcendentalist, but if you've ever read her "Ain't I a Woman" speech, it's really transcendental. Mm-hmm. So, so uh, you know, so with with the book that that you just showed, you know, mm-hmm. he talks a lot, and I've only read. I haven't gotten into it that much. I read. I started it, and I haven't had a chance to finish it. But he kind of talks about the idea uh, of of you know, we, we, how do I say this nicely? We we live in a racist world whether we like it or not whether we're aware of it or not you know and so we need to we need to kind of transcend that idea and 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 seriously look at not only our own actions but the actions of of everybody that we come in contact with um you know And, and, and even in his other books he even traces the history you know, back hundreds and hundreds of years to um, to Europe and you know the Catholic Church and how they interpreted pieces of the Bible to say people of color were actually descendants from you know a an a, you know a cursed tribe or something like that. Right. And so that's right. how deep it goes. It's not just something that you know started with the slavery in America. You know, it was before that, and it's just been further and further ingrained. And you know, South America and the whole. It, it's you're right it's not just our culture but it's it's all over the world and how do you get back to the point of you know believing in the inherent um, um, dignity of every human being like that's a very transcendental idea well and 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 and, and that's the thing so now uh, you know the last couple of years we you know we've started to question things like well why are there confederate monuments or 
or or you know why are why is the name Washington Redskins offensive to some people and, and things like that you know and a lot of people are really showing a lot of resistance to that you know you know well my my grandfather never killed Indians well right. well well that's great but this has nothing to do with your grandfather this has to do with with people who are living now you know yeah. and 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 how do you, you know we we just need to be more inclusive in our culture yeah. you know we, we've always considered ourselves this melting pot but yet i don't know if we really act like we're a melting pot because yeah. you know we we get upset we get upset be you know suddenly you know calling calling you know covid-19 the the chinese flu or the the wuhan flu or or whatever yeah. you know i just find that so offensive yeah but yet yeah. but yet there and, are people and, and, who, and literally you know, like people are subject to violence because of you know this prevailing idea that you can blame you know, something on, you know, a, a race of people or somebody's ethnicity or something like that. It, it's right. as if, it's as if like a lot of people have denied the power of words, but suddenly we're, we're reckoning with, you know, the, the use of words and, you know, like the Redskins or, you know, whatever like that into how horribly offensive that is and how that just reinforces ideas of, um, of racism. And look, just because just because they've always been called the Washington Redskins, or just because there's always been Confederate monuments, doesn't mean that it's okay. Right, <laughs> yeah. right. And, and a lot right. of Confederate monuments weren't put up, you know, at, immediately after the Civil War. It was, you know, generations later, like in the 1930s, even, you know, where it was the people with money who wanted to reinforce this you know, the, the false narrative of, you know, the, the South that actually had won, you know, or had retained their dignity or like whatever, whatever that story is, you know. Well, and look, as a historian, I know very well that his, history uh, is linear, okay? And so not only is history always changing, but the way that we study and write about history has always been changing. You know, I, when I do my research, I don't necessarily go and look for books that were written in the 1930s or the 1940s. I try to find books that were written within the last five to 10 years uh, or research that was done in the last several years, because I know that the study of history has changed just as much as anything else. And, and so, you know, by taking down Confederate monuments, by changing sports names, you know, I don't think that we're, we're not erasing history. I think we're correcting history. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, and allowing history to evolve into, a, like, as you were saying, a more inclusive version of getting everybody's stories to be told. Right. You know? And, and we're, and, and so, We've done that in Concord. I think we're getting better at doing that in Concord because now we have the Robbins House, and and you know the Concord Museum has a really great uh, exhibit on the Native peoples that were here before the Europeans were here, and and so, and from a personal level, you know I try to talk uh, about way more or lecture on way more than just the dead white guys. You know, yeah. I, I, I kind of like the dead black guys and the dead and the dead women as well. <laughs> you well know? And, and all, yeah. And also as a historian, I feel like it's so interesting to hear new stories or new perspectives or, you know, just because I feel like a lot of it, especially Concord history is very much about, you know, April 19th, 1775. And, you know, and then the transcendentalists and you hear sort of a lot of like the history 101 version. But, right. you know, this is why I love having conversations like this, where you can sort of get into the philosophies of historians and, you know, how they're helping history catch up with pop culture, you know, modern day reckoning, you know, and just sort of being being more and more truthful. And yeah, correcting the correcting the, um, the record. Right. And and getting back to the idea of the transcendentalists, they were pretty inclusive. You know, it, it, the, the transcendental club, so-called, started out as a bunch of Unitarian ministers 
and Bronson Alcott. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, eventually Margaret Fuller, Elizabeth Peabody, um, uh, other women that, that they were friends with, they were all kind of part of the Transcendental Club. Um, right. The Dial, and, the Dial was very, you know, good at The Dial, sure. Yeah. Sure. You know, the Dial was written by men and women. Um, yeah. And the the Boston anti-slavery societies, the, the, the Massachusetts uh, anti-slavery society, w was absolutely inclusive. You know, William Lloyd Garrison made sure that there were black abolitionists fighting next to him. He made sure that there were women and black women fighting next to him. So, you know, the, the abolitionist movement, I think, was the first real integrated social movement of the of of the of the of the nineteenth century. Because mm -hmm. here you had people of color, you had women, you had white men, they're all kind of coming together to fight for the abolition of slavery. That had never really been done before. Um, and and so you would go to a to an anti-slavery event in Boston, and you would see William Lloyd Garrison, Wendell Phillips, Frederick Douglass, Lucy Stone, <laughs> you know, yeah. these amazing people all on the same stage giving, giving anti-slavery speeches. Um, it must have just been absolutely incredible to hear all of those stories um, from, from the different points of view because, yeah, you know, William Lloyd Garrison could get up and talk about how bad slavery was, but here comes Frederick Douglass. And he's telling you exactly how bad slavery was. And then, Lucy hand, Stone, yeah. right, and then Lucy Stone gets up and she starts talking about how bad, badly women are being treated, you know, and comparing it to the treatment of, of the slaves and the treatment of the black man. So yeah. this integration and this diversity of the anti-slavery movement. And, you know, we, uh, um, was it Ellen Garrison in Concord? Uh, she was involved, you know, a woman of color was involved with the female anti-slavery society. She was one of the founders. So, yeah. you know, I think, you know, it must have been pretty amazing for some of these people, for these, for these, these white women and men to have a person of color join their ranks. It must have been absolutely incredible to have somebody like Ellen Garrison or Frederick Douglass or Lewis Hayden or, or any of these people of color join your ranks and say, yeah, I'm with you. Because as a white person, not only would it show you, I think, that you're on the right track, that you're doing the right thing, but yeah. now suddenly you, are, you have with you somebody who's experienced the horrors firsthand. Right. Uh, right. Um, and, and that really gives that gives your movement a lot, a lot of, uh, a lot of street cred <laughs> to use a, to use a, a 20th century term, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I really feel like actually transcendental transcendentalism was made stronger by including abolitionism as, you know, one of the things that they were, um, that was, that they were making part of the conversation. Because yeah. And the yeah, new the new, the new thing now you know talking about how you know history is always moving forward or the study of history is always moving forward it seems i i swear within the last year i've started to hear more and more about black transcendentalists you know which i don't think any of us have really talked about them that much to tell you the truth but yeah. you're like oh yeah of course there were why wouldn't there be so right. so again more things, more things to learn, more people to learn about. Exactly. It, it wasn't just Emerson and Thoreau and the Alcotts, you know, <laughs> there's a lot more people that we can be talking about. So. Exactly. And, and, and honestly, so this is why I love social media and I love, you know, having a, just a platform of Facebook because the group Transcendentalist 2021 is sort of just about covering, you know, all of the mentions that come in about, you know, like there was something in the New Yorker the other day about how, you know, Sojourner Truth was teaching knitting to people, um, you know, to, right. to help them earn money, right? Like, um, and it was a larger article about knitting. I feel like a lot of these mentions are now getting, you know, quote unquote, woven together, like pun intended, um, <laughs> in, 
into, into the larger story of transcendentalism and it's not just um, able to be, you know, kept in one book, you know, or it's not just these main authors. It's how a lot of people were responding to that whole movement. Um, well, it's and, not as, it, it wasn't as fringe as we like to think it was, you know, there, even, again, even if a person did not necessarily consider him or herself a transcendentalist, um, I think Walt Whitman being a good example, never once did Walt say I'm a transcendentalist. But everything Walt is writing and talking about is really transcendental. Um, again, Sojourner Truth, um, uh, she's saying things that are incredibly transcendental. Um, and, and so all of these people, they're, let's face it, they're, they're just trying to do what's right, whether it's politically, culturally, spiritually. They're just trying to right. do what they think is right. And, right. and that's, you know, and, and Thoreau says that in civil disobedience. You know, my, obli my only obligation is to do what I think right at any time. So, and, and that's what these people are doing, you know. And, and if you think about it, you know, sitting here in our, our cushy little houses in the 21st century, we like to think, well, yeah, of course I'd be an abolitionist. Why wouldn't I be? But... Right these people were really putting their lives and their reputations on the line. You know, William Lloyd Garrison got dragged through the streets of Boston by, by a pro-slavery mob. And they weren't even really a mob. They were a bunch of people. It was quoted that they were people of, of upstanding. So it's not even like rabble. These were like middle-class and upper-class people who were really angry at him speaking out against slavery. So, you know, it's easy for us to say nowadays, well, I'd be an abolitionist, but I don't know. There's a lot of things going on in our country right now that people should be speaking out against and nobody is. So- Well, or not enough, know, yeah. Or not enough, sure, sure. You know, and so, you know, like the transcendentalists, it's up to each and every one of us to kind of look at ourselves in the mirror and look, and look inward to use a transcendental term. <laughs> Uh, to to realize or, or try to figure out how you want to be how how do you want to be involved in society you know do you do you want to be a member of society and fight for what's right and stand up what's right and stand up for people who cannot stand up for themselves or do you just want to kind of go with the flow and uh, and and as long as you know as long as I've got my Netflix. Um, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm good. I, I don't need to do anything else, you know? Yeah. So, and, and that's what all these people were doing. I think we cannot underscore enough how incredibly brave these abolitionists were, um, yeah. both black and white. Exactly. So that, that's a great note to end on. Thank you very much. Um, thank this you very much. Yes. Thank you very much for all of our audience for watching um, and tune in next week for another Conquered Days.